Bluetooth is connected. You ready for my, my presentation? Yes, we are. Thank you. All right. Well, I think Sir Dennis is having uh, some challenges with, with the hair. Like, I could have heard the volume was a bit faint. So I hope he heard me very clearly. Um, let me, first of all, extend my, my thanks to the committee for inviting me to address you. Uh, I believe the, the protocol has been established. I will not necessarily embark on doing that. It's a pleasure to be able to address you. Um, okay. Okay. Nabila, and you are all in a country that I perhaps prefer to be right now as a distinction myself. And as we discuss issues in relation to the Caribbean Court of Justice and the justice system uh, in general, I think it's it's a privilege for me to be able to address you. Let me just thank my Colleague in the profession, uh, Mr. Daniel, and those who spoken at the National Anthem. It's good to hear the Solution National Anthem. Normally, when I hear the National Anthem these days, it's the anthem of another country. So it's good to hear the anthem of, of, of my own country. Um, before I make the presentation to you, just a couple of things that I think it's important for me to mention. Um, you would know that I am a sitting judge of the Eastern Caribbean Supreme Court and assigned to Anguilla. But it is important uh, to underscore from the very inception that the views that I expressed this evening are my personal views and I'm happy to be a part of it. General action, this is I'm speaking my personal view. And I'm also, I'm also not an agent for the Caribbean Court of Justice. But I am happy that the committee uh, called upon me to assist in this uh, public education campaign. Um, the last KBA that I want to put forward is that I have two very young children and they are a little noisier, noisier than I am. So if in the course of my presentation I get some competition from the back of the room, I hope you forgive me for that as, as well. So I want to just begin. I, I don't know whether the host would allow me to share the screen because I don't have a few slides that I, I can share with you. Um, that's not allowing me to do that at the moment. I want to 
to start off this presentation with a quote from a former member of the Privy Council itself. who indicated in 2003 that he was in the Caribbean speaking about the role of the Privy Council in the Caribbean. And this is a Privy Councillor, and he's saying that a part of your home is necessary if you are going to have the full benefit of what a final court can do to transform the society in partnership with the other branches of and so, as a Privy Councillor himself, and as one who sat at the highest levels of our own court system, it was encouraging Caribbean people to begin to realize that some of the very issues that we face and the transformation that we are looking for will not accomplish it unless we actually have a final court of our own. Now, I wanted to focus a little bit on Lord Hoffman's speech because there are three things that, to my mind, come out to me, and in my experience as a two who studied in England, is that there are three things, just this moment. Yeah, we're getting some competition now. The three things coming out of Lord Hoffman's statement is that the final court of appeal is necessary. It's not merely something that we desire. But the members of the Privy Council themselves are saying that your final court of appeal is actually necessary. The second thing that Lord Hoffman has indicated is that it is beneficial. And the third thing that he encourages us is that we can only transform the society if we build partnership between the three branches of government to address the problems, <coughs> some of which was discussed by your chairman, this is what we And if I can just address the first aspect of it, the necessity of bringing home the final court of appeal, and I want to say something. The necessity of bringing home the final court of appeal is just as important as it was to bring home our parliament, is just as important as it was to bring home our executive. Because an English professor once said that nobody who is starting a democracy afresh would design a court that looks like a judicial committee. If we were to think about how you were going to establish a court structure, no one would start that looks anything like a Council. Because I can tell you that in 1641, the English thought that the Privy Council was inefficient and abolished it when it abolished the Court of the Star Chamber. And in 1675, through the Committee of Laws of Trade and the Plantation, the Privy Council was imposed as a final Court of Appeal of Caribbean society, where 80% of our population was slaves. And so even the English thoughts over three, four hundred years ago that this was an inefficient way for a final court of appeal to exist. And in 1828, senior lord who was examining the judicial system across English territories, he says, even in 1828, at the time when 80% of the people in the institution were slaves, a senior privy councillor was saying that it is obvious that from the late distance of the colonies and the immense variety of matters arising in England, foreign to our habits and beyond the scope of our knowledge, any judicial tribunal in this country must of necessity be extremely inadequate or extremely inadequate for them. That was even before slavery had ended. And senior members of the Privy Council themselves were already saying that this is inadequate and cannot work. In 2008, it's much later than that. 
in. Lord Gaynor, another member of the Privy Council, said, look, a judge who is sitting in a local constitutional environment, in which he has grown up and with which he is familiar, is likely to have a surer sense of what falls within the privy of the Constitution and what falls beyond than a court sitting many months ago. The idea of the adequacy of the Privy Council is something that was first called into question by members of the Privy Council themselves. And they have consistently said for hundreds of years that this is not welcome. And in the hundreds of years, the Privy Council at some point was the final court of appeal of perhaps at least 30 to 40% of all of the countries in the entire world. And by the end of the independence era, only a handful of Caribbean countries and one or two else have held on to it. Despite the fact that even as recent as 2018, judges have been saying that this is not bad. In 1999, another Privy Councilor by the name of Lord Brown said the Caribbean countries need their own court. In 2009, and I want to talk a little bit about 2009 because something happened in 2009 that we didn't know about. Members of the Privy Council, or those who sit on the Privy Council, are also those who sit on the highest court in England, which at the time was the House of Lords. In 2009, by a simple vote of the House of Assembly in England, the House of Lords was abolished. And the Supreme Court was established in England, with different mechanisms in place for the appointment of judges. And we did not participate in that process. But those persons who would become the judges of the Supreme Court would also become the judges of the final court of the people's institution. And by a simple majority of the British Parliament, that was changed. A gentleman by the name of Lord Phillips, the first president of the UK Supreme Court. And in one of his first interviews, he said that it is time for the Caribbean to have their own final The inaugural president of the UK Supreme Court, hundreds of years after Lord Johan spoke about it, has still indicated to us that this is not adequate and we need our own. So that is what has happened. Now I want us to, I want to speak a little bit about what has happened in St. Lucia in relation to its own relationship with the Privy Council over the years? And I want to start with the year 1967, because although sometimes we push our independence to 1979, it's true. But 1967 was perhaps sometime a more constitutionally relevant period, because that was when we became associated states. It was when we established our own. Eastern Caribbean Supreme Court, which was named different. And this year, our court has celebrated 55 years of its existence. And for solution of the Privy Council in that 55 year period, has only been about 29 judgments coming from the Court of Appeal in St. Lucia. That is only 0.53 judgments per year, less than a judgment a year. I mean, from solution delivered by the Privy Council in matters. Now, I want, to, I want us to, to think for a moment about all of the things that have happened in our country in these 55 years. We've been independence, we've been through political struggles, we've been through hurricanes, we've been through so many challenges. And one can hardly find a judgment from the Privy Council that necessarily addresses some of the most significant constitutional challenges that we are facing in these people. Less than a judgment a year means that the final court of appeal has contributed very little to some of the most significant legal challenges that have faced us as a nation. And remember, 
hundreds of years ago, the Privy Council was telling us that this is a new code. The last judgment that the Privy Council delivered from St. Lucia was in 2017. It means that in five years, the Privy Council has not delivered a judgment on an appeal from St. Lucia. Now again, I want us to think about what we've experienced as a country in five years, in the last five years. We've had elections, we've had hurricanes, we've had numerous challenges, we've had crime, we've had a pandemic, and we had to take significant steps legally and otherwise to protect ourselves. And when you look at the role that the US Supreme Court, even the UK Supreme Court, and other Supreme Courts have played in dealing with the court constitutional challenges that will arise because of these specific problems. In St. Lucia, we have not utilized our time. And now, I sometimes find that when we speak about these types of statistics, we gloss over them. But you have to ask yourself the very honest question as to why it is that we are the only region in the world, or some of, some of our countries are the only countries in the world, that limit our appeals to a court of appeals because we have a final court that we tend to simply not to use. And so for all the reasons sometimes we say we need a privy, we start looking at the decisions and we start realizing we're not even using the privy because for the reasons we say that we need to stay with. Five years without a judgment from your final court is a stifling of your development in the law. And the last four judgments that were delivered by the Privy Council, in all four, it is here that our final court, that our court of appeal was around. So let's just go through some of the statistics of how our courts have fared when matters have gone to the Privy Council. We had 29 decisions, as I've said. 19 out of those 29 decisions, the court of appeal has said, the Privy Council, sorry, has said that our court of appeal was around. That is a 66% rate from the Court of Appeal indicating that the decisions of your courts were actually right. And as I've said, in the last seven years, every time a matter has been, a uh, judgment has been handed down by the Privy Council from St. Lucia, it is said that our courts were right. And it speaks to the ability of the court to provide justice. And sometimes I think when we speak about ourselves, we speak about ourselves in a very negative sense. That we are somehow incapable of being on a final court. We are incapable of being who we need to be for our own people. But then when these decisions go over, the Council quite often says, no, we have a very good court. And it's working in many ways. And so the statistics stand head and shoulders above many of the other courts in the post colonial world in terms of what has happened before the Privy Council. But I want to take some time just to address you on an, an issue that issues that I have been, th I have been thinking of for a long time. As a young solution, growing up in solution, we faced a lot of challenges. And in response to these challenges, our legislature has intervened. Some of us in the room have been legislators. And in the quest to solve some of our problems, we passed and made some serious comprehensive changes to our legislation. Positive changes. And in the last 20 years, we passed a new criminal code revamped criminal legislation. We changed the way we collect our evidence and we present our evidence in the courts. We changed the rules for criminal law and practice. We abolished things like preliminary inquiries. So for those who don't know what a preliminary inquiry is, if you have a murder case, for example, before the case goes to the High Court, the magistrate will go through the evidence to see whether there is sufficient evidence for it to go to trial. Now we're sending our matters directly to the head. These types of changes have an impact on some of the things that troubles us as a state. The delay in the justice system, how quickly 
the rights of the indigenous how the police can get evidence in criminal matters, how they present the evidence in court, and all of it has an impact. When I became a magistrate, for example, some of the practices that was a response to the changes in the legislation I thought was beginning to cause more delays in the system. But in 20 years, after such a significant change, and some of us will remember when these changes were taking place, there were controversies. Right? We had controversies about abortion. Controversies about, I think it was section 631 and the press. Tougher penalties, different constitutional questions that came about as a result of these comprehensive changes. If I were to tell you then that in the almost 20 years, since we have made all of these significant changes to our criminal justice system. Our final court of appeal has only delivered one judgment in 20 years on the significance and the interpretation of some of that legislation. And there's a reason I, I, I wanted to, to, to speak to that, I speak about the CCG, because sometimes people tell us, but why the CCG when your local courts are not closed? Why the CCJ when we have all this crime? Why all of it? And if we go back to what Lord Hoffman was saying, he was saying, you really are not going to solve all of these problems if you keep having a free council. Because the pace, the, 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 the reason you need a final court of appeal to take that second opinion at some of these issues is because it helps. It helps in the issues of delay. It helps in the issues of magistrates and how they perform their functions. Even by giving clarity to the law, it helps the police understand how they are to carry out investigations. These things are not just desirabilities, ladies and gentlemen. They are necessary if we are to actually solve some of the things that really troubles us a lot. So when you are magistrates conducting wadis, for example, in circumstances that has arisen maybe because of any interpreted laws. Every jurisdiction in the world will say, look, some of these things need a second appellate When you look at Barbados, you look at Belize, you look at Guyana, you look at Dominica, you begin to see that the CCJ is having an impact even in the issues such as delay, clarity in investigations and evidence. And we are, we practically cut off the head of these key areas of development in the world. And the Privy Councillor is saying, you are not going to solve these problems unless you repatriate this institution because the final court is a different type of institution that will actually help solve all of these problems. And so we need to think about it. Another Privy Councillor, I don't think he sat on judicial matters, but Francis Jacob, who's a Queen's Council, a Privy Council, he said this. A Supreme Court of high caliber has been established in the Caribbean, which is able to take account of local values and develop a modern Caribbean jurisprudence in an international context. Recently, I had a conversation member of the diplomatic corps of one of foreign countries. And she said to me, one of the most impressive institutions that have been established in recent times is the Caribbean Court of Justice. It has risen to become one of the most respected institutions, judicial institutions. Judges such as Sir Dennis, such as Justice Saunders, this is Jamada. A traveling the world, engaging in judicial education and helping to strengthen judicial systems across the world. And its systems are working. When I spoke to you earlier about the fact that we had less than a case a year of appeals to the Privy Council. In places like Barbados that have signed on to the CCG, they have increased the number of appeals by over 200%. So I say to people, if, if you have a court that no one is even getting a judgment from in half a decade, 
the tomorrow court that Privy Council is referred to as a court of high caliber that has been able to deliver justice in a multiplicity of jurisdictions and is able to come into the jurisdictions and help with backlog reduction. The amount of judicial education that I have received on things like judicial ethics, independence of the judiciary, have come from my interactions with persons like Justice Byron, persons like Justice Saunders. I studied in England. I've been on the bench for 10 years. I've never met a privy council. But the amount of hours of judicial education and training and discussions on how can we reduce our backlogs, how can we react to the public sentiment of trust and confidence? How do we write our judgments properly? How do we manage our courts so that our cases can move smoothly? The hours of training that the Caribbean Court of Justice is putting into the region is unmatched. Something that the Privy Council has not done in the hundreds of years that it has been the final court of our country. And if the Privy Council is to refer to the court as a court of high caliber, then we need to reflect for ourselves as to whether or not we may be missing the moment here. When I studied in England, I came across decisions of a court that's very little spoken of from a historical context, and I was surprised at it. In 1962, the Federation failed, but we forgot that there was a Federal Peace Court that delivered good results. And I asked myself as a young person studying, how long will we continue to allow our institutions to fail? And so, so even Francis Jacob QC commends this court of high caliber. But Hoffman also said, look, this is beneficial. It's not just it's necessary, it's beneficial. He said something that I've been thinking about a lot in the years that I have been. that I have been a judge. He said this, a, a final court should be a part of your nation. It should be a representative of your community and it should share in the values and the history of your community. I, and I want us to, to understand this. We need to think, and I want to ask this question to us. As, a, as a, an institution, I see people there that, that don't see the word, I see my light here. You've been a member of the Wise Club for a long time. And the Daniel, you know, this is what I've interacted with. And I want to ask us, what, when we think of ourselves as people, as an entity, as an organization, what do we say as a nation are our values? How do we think of ourselves as where we came from? How would we describe ourselves as individuals in our country in terms of the values that we share? And I want to, I want to explain why I raise this issue within the context of the Caribbean Court of Justice. When I was when I was studying at the university, a friend of mine said something to me. Because we were having a conversation and I said something and I said one of the things that I noticed is that the students from the Caribbean have spoke very negatively about themselves and about their countries. And he pointed out to me that there were some students from other countries, countries ravaged by civil and political war. They spoke more positively about their countries than the Caribbean people. And I thought, I've been thinking about that for a long time because a lot of the times, as an attorney, when people speak about our justice system, we speak about our political systems, we normally characterize ourselves as being people who are corrupt. We characterize ourselves as being people who are biased and 
So those are the views of the way we speak about ourselves and the bar and the... And I, I have thought about it a lot. Are these really our values? Are these really the values that we want our children to take into the next generation about how we feel about ourselves? And in, I think it was in 1986 or 1987, I grew up in a, a community in Central Shire called Kakobamu. I don't know if some of you know it. It's a high community, by the way. It's a community called Fokani, and some places will have to Fokani and West Tirushi. They were in the forest, yeah, and so forth. And so in about 1986 or 1987, there about, there was a lady who lived higher than me. I was about five or six years old. And the lady lived higher than me for me. Her name was Mary Rapley. And I remember the fear that the entire community was very rapidly for me. I remember the dreams I had. And I'm 40 years old now. And recently I was conducting a little piece and I was looking at the pain that families go through when their loved ones are murdered. And I said to myself, if I, 40 years ago, can you remember how I felt when Mary Ratcliffe was murdered in front of the children, sisters and brothers. The family that went through that pain. And between that time and now, there's just been so much bloodshed on our streets. So many people in our country have suffered the indignity of seeing their loved ones murdered, their homes broken into, their wives and their sisters and their brothers raped and murdered, the abuse. And I have thought a lot about these things lately because sometimes when we begin to speak about things like Caribbean controversies, it's what people bring up that look at all of this and in a sense the challenge that comes with it is that people look at that, and I say us because it's not just the journalists, it's not just the politicians. And they cry out for a deeper sense of justice and a deeper sense of institutions of their countries working for them. And seeing that we can get to a point where we can address the challenges that we really actually face. And when a lot of Hoffman says, the member of the Privy Council, a final court is important because it shares those values. One of the things that I want to, to tell us tonight is that we need to stop thinking, and maybe persons like myself, there needs to be an active engagement, talk and a discussion with persons like us. We need to stop thinking of ourselves as being at cross purposes, as being enemies, as being persons who are contrary, that somehow we look at our judges, our magistrates, our lawyers, and even our politicians as people who are part of a different sort of society who don't feel the pain of the average person. And what Lord Hoffman is actually trying to tell us is that nobody is going to come from the outside and solve these problems for us. We have to find ways to work together, regardless of political affiliation, profession, religion, or any other of these things, to see how we can solve our problem. And if you want to have something like the final point of appeal that is critical to helping solve these problems, then if nobody is going to use it in five years, and if the areas of law that need to develop in order for us to see these changes, will not come from it. And we have to look within. We 
we have to stop thinking that the children we educated yesterday and we sent to school so that they could be lawyers and be doctors and be engineers and be politicians. And somehow when they come back from school and start trying to do the job, they become the enemy. We have to start thinking about what is from a different perspective. And I agree that maybe from the perspective of the judiciary, the legal profession, there's a lot of work that we need to do. But we can only do these things when we realize that we share the values. We want to see the institutions that we build into this survive for our children. We want to see less murder, less bloodshed. And so, we have to begin to see ourselves as sharing the values that are necessary for us to be able to grow our systems. And I think of the indigenous Caribbean Court of Appeal and the work that Justice Saunders, Justice Byron, Justice uh, De La Bastille, many of our juries have done. We're trying to accomplish these are things that we don't speak about. We don't speak a lot about Susie Dove and Vincent Close. There are many solutions we work to try to see justice being done despite the challenges that we face. So the question is whether and to what extent judicial accountability is compromised with a court that sits thousands of miles away while we continue to look down on our own people within the quality who are better capable of helping. You know, again, just looking at Malika's face, the amount of hours we spent feeding children and doing so many things and trying to help with his poverty and injustice. Imagine the children that leave school books, go to school, and then that child becomes a judge and you tell them, because of your lawyer, I trust you. Today we will say to a 12 year old, the sky is the limit. But then we continue institutions that limit what our people can actually do to contribute to our societies. And we have to think about what our values are. And I want to talk, I mean, I've spoken about the good. Many people speak about this in relation to access to justice. Again, if I can just share some of my own experiences with you. When I was a lawyer in private practice, we had a case that went to the Court of Appeal. It was a difficult case. And we felt that there was a chance that we could go to the Privy Council and win the appeal. But when we contacted the attorneys in London, they wanted £25,000 as a deposit. At the time, the pound was over 5 EC dollars a pound. So that was 125 EC dollars just to file the claim. And so the clients came back to say we can't afford to appeal. And we were unable to take this matter forward. The cost of litigation is a hindrance to people being able to access the courts. And it's probably why you have a situation in five years you don't get a judgment from there. Now, some people will say, some people will say, well, okay, but lawyers in, in the country charge a lot of money. And I do think that fruitful discussions, we have to be able to talk to each other about how we can build systems like legal aid systems. The court itself, if we were to read judgments in the court, we realize that the court is also doing its best to try to cut down on the cost that people have to pay to get into courts. During the last few years, when we went into the pandemic, now, a lot of us would remember that our societies were closing down. Businesses were closing. We had to find a way to make sure that the court was open. So we had to have situations where the people are abusing their homes, they can't, they can't say the court is closed because of COVID. The crime is taking place, you can't shut down the courts. And many of our civil courts still have to remain able to deal with child maintenance issues. And one of the ways in which our court was able to survive is because of some of the systems that we put in place that have allowed people to file documents electronically on the computer. And that has significantly reduced the cost. 
Because whereas you had to find three or four or five sets of multiplicity of documents, now you can find one document in the portal. And we were able to use Zoom and many other ways to make our pod function. And in many respects, our pod worked and functioned during the pandemic in ways that in our civil courts, I can say that we have no backlogs in our civil courts. Criminal courts have different challenges. You have juries, you have other things that makes it a little more challenging. And our criminal justice system doesn't need a national discussion on how we can move matters forward. But our civil courts are functioning. And contrary to what a lot of us believe, the average person who is coming to our courts are not rich. Most of what I have seen on our benches since I have been a judge, a child maintenance cases, a child molestation cases, marriage and divorce, people fighting over family land. Sometimes I see people say to me, well, you know, the court sex is for politicians. I say, no, the average person who is coming to court office is not suing a politician. I said to a friend of mine the other day, your wife is more likely to sue you than a politician. Your children are affected by cases. And so access to justice becomes important for the poorest of us. The Caribbean Court of Justice has proven that in the countries where it sits, more people are taking cases to the final court by over 250% in some cases. So we need to develop our jurisprudence and develop systems that make the cost of litigation work for us. The last thing Lord Hawkins spoke about in the quote that I have was to work together, which I spoke about before. The, Mr. Daniel, who is your chairman, spoke openly about judicial independence and the integrity of the judiciary. But the judiciary and the other branches of government, the House of Assembly, your Senate, your cabinet, prime minister, and cabinet of ministers, we all have to find ways to work together to solve the problems that grip our society. And what the Privy Council judge was saying there is, you're never going to really solve these problems if you don't find ways to work together and work together from within. And so people have always been dissatisfied with the administration of justice, but I believe we can work together to solve it. Kofi and I said that the rule of law is not a luxury. Justice is not a side issue, it is an important issue. And I say that for far too long, we've taken our courts and made it a side issue. Investment in our courts so that they can function properly is important. And here's the thing. The final court of appeal, like the Caribbean Court of Justice, has been doing the kind of work that the Privy Council has not been able to do to help us deal with these problems. It's a lot of work in educating judges, in coming into the countries to deal with back a of cases, in getting statistics done and helping different systems to deal with the problems. And that is the role of the final court that the Privy Council has never played. So, the current president of the Caribbean Court of Justice, I'm sure some of us have met him, some of us may not have, is a gentleman by the name of Adrian Solnes, is of essential national and a man I respect very much. And he said that. The issue of public confidence and the way we feel about our judiciaries is not really just about the quality of our judges. We produce good quality judges. Maybe I am the least of them. I don't know. But it is also because across the region, we can enhance our judiciary if we provide suitable courts, enough staff, modern facilities, and opportunities for our judges and our magistrates to continuously educate themselves. That must come from the executive branches of government. The court does not fund itself. We don't, have, we, don't, you know, we don't collect money from people to come to court. So we need to work together. And so Adam Lewis said this in 1967. He said, our Supreme Court is an essential part of the structure of government. It is established by our constitution, and it is independent. And I want to say, as a young solution and a young judge, I believe fully that not only do we have independent courts, but that the Caribbean Court of Justice and the way it is set up 
is set up as one of the most independent courts that has ever been set up. The system for how you appoint judges do not involve politicians. The court is fully funded without the need at this point for politicians or any other branch of government to get involved in funding. It is the most independent institution judiciary that has been set up in modern times. So it is an example of how the concerns that we have have been taken on board and how the court has been set up. And I believe that it is working. And I believe firmly that it will continue to work. So, when it is our duty, when we have to do something, we have to do it properly. We have experience in our system, the challenges we experience, the things that we have to think about. I can tell you that in the Eastern Caribbean Supreme Court, our judges look very, very hard and work hard. <laughs> In our civil courts, where we can produce the reforms, and Dennis Byron is there and he's led reforms from 2000 to now. In our civil courts, we don't really have backlogs. Criminal justice is a bit of a challenge because you need the physical infrastructure. But when we talk about delay, what I want to leave with you is that we've been talking about the need for Caribbean court from the 1800s. And we keep delaying what even the Privy Council is saying we need to do if we are to do it. So not only with delays in our justice system cause injustice, but delay in bringing home this jurisdiction which is necessary for us to move forward is an injustice to our people. And so I commend the Caribbean Court of Justice to you. And I hope that my presentation was of some value to you. I know sometimes he's speaking about legal issues, it could be a bit complicated. I hope I have not uh, been too complicated to this evening, but I would wish. To encourage you as a party to have these discussions, to encourage you as a party to understand how important it is for us at this time to grow our institutions, so that we can create institutions that can take our children into the future. So I hope that was of some assistance to you. I hope I didn't bore you. And I hope that we can continue to have fruitful dialogue as a society as to how we can take our country forward. So I wonder if you can look back. We can remember the days of crime. Remember the days of bloodshed and see that we move together to solve it. I pray that my children and yours will live in a society of peace. But I say to you, these children are to be educated, are to become lawyers, to become judges, to limit what they can do. I am a child of St. Lucia, educated to help my country. And to say to me that I am some sort of oligarch incapable of progress is not the way our country is ever going. And in a sense, that's what we continue to say when we continue to look down on institutions like the Caribbean Court of Justice that we have built ourselves and is working. So that's my encouragement to you this evening. I hope it was for you. but enough to allow for us to contemplate where we go from here. 
and thanks also for your very personal anecdotes that added quite some submission flavor to it as well. Let us thank him again. May I now invite Mr. Michael Gordon KC to address you. Please let us welcome him. comments 
when I put in my plea in mitigation. <laughs> there is one statistic that he didn't mention. We have had, I believe, two plebiscites in our area dealing with the issue of the Caribbean Court of Justice. In the case of Grenada, the magnificent percentage of 23 of the voters actually voted. I'm not sure what the percentage was in St. Vincent, though the figure 27 sticks in my mind but I don't offer that as fact. What that means is that people want justice. They want to be persuaded that they will get justice. And they are confident that the legislators will put in place a justice system that having been put in place becomes absolutely independent of them. I am an unashamed and very strong proponent of the Caribbean Court of Justice. I find it deeply offensive when people tell me, well, we don't think we have as good judges in the Caribbean as they have in life. What a load of garbage. And I did have to think for a gentle word to say. <laughs> I hope that you will go away from this affair, this lecture, with a much clearer idea of what the Caribbean Court of Justice would mean to our overall development. <clears throat> One of the issues that Justice Moise, and he couldn't touch all of them, but I will just briefly mention, the way the court is financed makes it, there's nothing impossible, but makes it virtually impossible for any political interference in the court by the means of using finance. I hope that this is the first of many workshops I hope that they will all remain unpolitical, because this is not a political issue. This is a social development issue. So Dennis, I, if you can hear me, I hope you have done you justice. I doubt it. But thank you very much indeed. I believe the next uh, Item on the agenda is Mr. Randy Williams. Mr. Matthew Roberts, former Speaker of the House of Assembly, 
Okay. Mr. David Vitalis, an experienced media practitioner. Ms. Renny Sidros, who was the immediate past, who is the immediate past president of the Sidney Shabal Association, and of course myself. Mm -hmm. I serve as the executive secretary to the committee. So the committee's mandate is twofold. The first is to guide the, the accession process by advising on the draft legislation, ensuring that timelines are met and um, providing regular updates to the government. The committee is also charged with leading a public education campaign to inform and educate the public on the accession process, and more importantly, the role and functions of the Caribbean Court of Justice. So, over the next couple of weeks, the committee will be meeting with various groups and in civil society, and um, we also, simultaneously with that, we will be doing the rollout of a media campaign to give to bring more information to the general public as to um, the, the role of the CCJ, how, how it is for, what, what, what dedication governs it, and um, how it will impact um, the Lucia's justice system when fully implemented. So thus far, the committee has been the Bar Association, the Rotary Club of St. Lucia, and the chair of the committee has had a one-on-one -on -one meeting with the leader of the opposition, which has um, spread spun off into this um, gathering here this evening. And we thank you for taking out the time to meet, to meet with us. It's been a very enjoyable morning with the leader of the opposition. Um, so it is a schedule with um, the stakeholders and the media campaign, as I um, indicated earlier, is being finalized and should roll out later in the month of November. So just to give a, a, a background of what has happened so far, in April of this year, the government of St. Lucia signaled to the government of the UK, to the then um, Foreign Secretary, um, Liz Truss, we know her ultimate fate after that. Um, <laughs> Um, our intention to to terminate a, a piece of the Privy Council in August of um, in August of, of this year, the and the um, the government of the UK signaled its non-objection to St. Lucia and gave us the go ahead to begin the um, the process, the our constitutional and legislative process to um, to begin to um, remove end a piece of the Privy Council. This is, of course, in accordance with Section 41 of the Constitution, which provides that you need the, uh, the non-objection of the UK to proceed. Well, following from that, in October, on October 11, to be precise, the, the first the bill, the Constitution of St. Lucia Amendment Bill, was made before the House of Assembly for its first reading. Now, there are um, constitutional strictures which must be followed. This bill cannot go through all its stages in one in one city. The constitution does provide for a 90 day a minimum 90 day period between its first and second reading, which will take us at this very earliest into early into early January. In this time and probably um, beyond that, this allows for continued discourse as we have in now, continued um, exposure and to allow persons to comment on the bill and for further um, debate um, of, and, of course, constructive criticism. So on behalf of the committee, we look forward to further engagement with you as this process continues. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Williams. And on behalf of the United Workers Party, let me express our most profound thanks to Sir Byron and his team for your Herculean effort thus far. I really do beg your indulgence as I break into Creole because this is being recorded and the intention is that more people in here will come and out of here, so to speak, will come to hear of this lecture and be exposed to some of what we had the privilege of hearing this evening. Alors, soir, parti d'un pitch en omitin pour cacher à sous si j'ai si si j'ai ça j'ai dit on appelle court pour replacer court la vitesse à côté on chaque nous savent c'est là 
nous amener que nous si un cas nous pas d'accord et puis jugement yo ba en cette ici alors nous c'est nous nous en soir ce baron est les autres camarades qui c'est c'est nous là qui a chargé ça fait si si j'ai parce que l'année ça là gouvernement cette ici décider qui cette ici qui a constitué
you very kindly. For recording purposes, can I please encourage you to use the microphone? One second. Well, I told you, Tanya is a stimulus. Good evening, everyone. I don't know if Mr. Boys is still online. But I would like to hear um, earlier make the statement saying that we do not have faith in our own system and we believe the system will be corrupt henceforth. That's why we, we seek outside intervention. But we have no other reason to think otherwise. I would like to bring up some recent cases that took place in the ocean. And I think that the Bar Association and not for once have they come out to educate the public as to if the ruling was right or what are the discussions. Take for example the case with the control of customs. There were long issues where the custom officer wrote a document and back and forth and we saw what happened at the courts. And not for once did anyone from the Bar Association or even one of the from the CCGA or one of the churches made a statement concerning that as to whether there was some level of biasness or justice was done in the right way. So here's the reason why sometimes we have to think otherwise that we cannot handle our own, our own system because there are so many questions unanswered and so many cases would go and go on the ground in the case. Because I could recall the leader of the opposition said, it's months he asked for a judicial review, and to date that cannot take place. So what we are left to question the judicial system on our island, and whether or not we should have any faith in the CCG, if locally we are being experienced such problems. Shall field two more questions before we invite our the panelists to respond from a madam, Your Excellency. Um, please, the microphone is yours. <coughs> oh, yeah. I need to ask a question to the entire team. No, it's not a question, actually, it's a statement. You see, I think I understand what the need for the CCG. Let me ask you a question. When you put information into a computer, you generate it. If there's not no, nobody's face, it has absolutely no relation with the person. It probably sees just numbers that represent the name. And so it is, you, 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 you actually know that the information coming out of the computer would probably be very accurate. When you deal with a group of people that you probably hang out with, went to school with, Guys, they, they dated, they, they, you know, went after a team up and check out the set of rooms and they have a lot of secrets going on each other. You know, and things like that. They lie, they do things, you know, and all kinds of things. And you're my best friend. There is no way you can take on the human element of that. You're good friends, you've done things, you're building secrets with each other. So something come up about me, about somebody, and it's your friend. Don't tell me that your friend is not going to talk to you about it behind the, behind closed doors and so on and influence your head. You see, these are the things people are thinking about. These groups of people in the CCJ are people we know, people we hang out with, people who hold secrets with, people that maybe maybe as independent as you say of any kind of government politicians have influenced them with that. Because they do. some of the people that they meet have things on them. So you just don't know. I mean, I'm just playing them and advocate there. They may have things on them, secrets and all kinds of things to make them twist the whole thing. These people are spending thousands of miles away. They don't know me. They don't know anything about me. They don't know you. And they say there's a million people. My bill is coming before them. And they may just act on the issue, but not on the fact that they know us. So, I mean, I'm just, as I'm saying, that is not, I'm just keep playing devil advocate. This is what people know the human element of relations, relationship, connection. And this is one of the things you have to convince people that it's 
not going to affect your decisions. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mr. Oswald, the Dustin, oh, I do sorry, beg your pardon, Mr. Sorry, Mr. James, and then also the Dustin. Thank you, King of what Sir Gordon said, that um, this decision is not a political issue. Don't you think something as important as the CCJ should not be put to a referendum of the people? Surely we all have a stake in it. Thank you. I have a few questions, probably about three or four. My first question is, the CCJ is um, situated in Trinidad. Why is Trinidad not a member of the We would like to know how the judges will be chosen for the CCJ. Because I have experience in a I would say an ex-politician. A politician who had just finished losing the elections was made a judge within the Caribbean. And I felt that if you're a politician, you cannot sit on my case. You cannot sit on my case if I am, if I have brought somebody case, if I'm a plaintiff or a defendant, you should not be sitting on my case if we were in opposite parties. Yeah. Yeah. So then I have to ask again, is it correct for, for past politicians to be judges in, in the CCJ? Our constitution states that once a government has two thirds of the parliament that they can enact laws. But two thirds in parliament does not mean that you have the support of two thirds of the population. Therefore, there is no harm in taking, in having a referendum before we establish the CCJ. Now I'm not against the CCJ. But as Dr. Fletcher just said, you are friends, you are comrades, you drink. We know most of us in the West Indies, we end up in the Kataways. I think it is very important that we have a referendum. If the people want to say yes, it's yes. If they want to say no, it's no. But it's not a decision because the government have two thirds in parliament should make for any one of us. Thank you very much, Oz. We won't tax you for asking more than one question. I'll take Mr. Louis and then turn to the panelists because there was some close correlation between the questions asked. So let me take Mr. Louis and then I turn to Sir Baron, uh, Justice Moise, Mr. Gordon, and Mr. William. Good night. I first want to say that I support the idea of the CCG. The idea. What I would like to see now, we've heard from proponents of the CCG, and of course they support it, and they would give us all the positives. However, I am sure there would be opponents as well. What I would like to see or hear is to hear from those persons who do not support the CCG. Give us the other side of the picture. Because no coin has only one side. Thank you. Thank you very much. One comment from Ms. Henry while our panelists prepare their notes. Good evening, everyone. I hope I'm not correcting the response by the panelists, but I really wanted to respond to this notion of, of um, influence. Um, well, let me say one thing, since we're on the topic of questions, 
Um, I made a point to, to hear um, that the panelists indicated there is very little to, to, it is almost impossible for there to be any financial influence. But that was the only aspect of influence that they, they, they pointed out. And I don't think that is the only concern of everyone here. I don't think it's the financial influence that we can say about, but other influences, as highlighted by, by Dr. Fletcher. Okay, so back to the comment. With respect to impartiality, I'm a forensic scientist. Um, and we recently received our accreditation because we developed a quality management <laughs> to social media to see what was being commented about the laboratory with respect to this, this attainment. Because I think comments are life. Um, comments, comments are from the people. You really want to read the comments because you have a really good idea of what's happening on the ground through the comments. So I went to the comments today, because I'm not really on social media, but one of the comments, I mean, I'm just not going to this very was, um, to do with, with partiality or influence. Okay, it says, what's to celebrate? I hope you all don't start fabricating evidence. The way things go in, I don't even have confidence in basic things on this island. Everything for same people, passports, evidence, etc. Now, that's life for me. So perception, I think, is real. Okay? Perception is everything. So the perception of this individual is that we will fabricate the evidence. A quality management system being a quality management system. A quality management system is necessary for a sound system. Yes. 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 by the, the feedback. But a quality management system, what a quality management system does is it establishes standards. It, does, it establishes it establishes standards and it establishes a system within which we have to operate. And the, and the reason why it looks like because there is accountability. That is what is lacking in our society. It's accountability. So if there is a case, I live in St. Lucia. I don't see everybody in this room. I will see names coming through the criminal justice system that I recognize. I'm an analyst, I work on the bench as well. So what I say to my analysts when I see something, and I get incensed a lot by a lot of people, sex violence against women, and girls, I get very incensed by that. So when I see these things, I say to my colleagues, you know what, I have to be I can't do it. Because I'm, I, because I'm, I'm passionate about it, you know? So I have to say, I need to step back and let somebody else who is more objective do it. But also, I must be guided by the science and the quality system that we have developed. One where there is peer review, where after I do my work, someone who is equally qualified as me will go through the entire case and say, yes, I would have come up with the same results that you would, the same conclusions. That is what standards and quality do for us. And that's where the accountability comes in, because if I, I there's a result, I take pictures so that the results are reviewable. So if I see in the picture, that the result is negative. How can I put on the report that it is positive? I can't do that. And someone else who is reviewing the case will see that it was it was negative. So that is what we want. We want accountability. That is what is lacking. This is why we have a culture of corruption because we lack accountability. <laughs> Justice Moise, may I please invite you to respond? You've got two minutes in which to do so. <laughs>
palpably wrong, patently wrong, then there is a process of appeal. I don't know whether that process was used, whether it was available, I don't know. I believe somebody remarked that we're a small community. Everybody has relationships. Well, we're not that small community. St. Lucia is a small community. But think of the judges who were sitting in St. Lucia. Probably half of them are not St. Lucians. So we don't have that proximity of relationship. But, and now I'm speaking from personal experience, the life of the judge is antisocial. You go to official issues, official uh, affairs, but generally speaking, your social life is with your family. That's it. In the I was on the court, I think it was eight years, it doesn't matter. I went to no parties whatsoever. And before I got my BA, I got my PA. I was a party <laughs> The issue was raised of a referendum. It's very difficult to argue against a referendum. The only argument I have against the referendum is this. People don't care. They don't turn up to the referendum. They don't vote. So why are we going to go through this process when the end result is not reflective of the popular vote? There's one other issue on the referendum. As sure as God made the elections, if there is a referendum and there is a question, one party is going to take one side and the other party is going to take the other side. So it becomes a political issue. And that is what I think is you have to make so And please afford the gentleman the courtesy of a listening ear. The question was raised, the court is in Trinidad, why is Trinidad not a member of the court? That was very interesting. What happened was, I believe it was Pande, who, I may be wrong on this, but a prime minister of the time bid for placing the court in Trinidad, committing very large sums of money to building the court. The court building is magnificent. It is fitted with the most modern electronic gear, etc. That government changed. Before the court was completed, before there was entry into the court by the country, the government changed, and subsequent government said, you know what, they wanted the court, we don't want the court, we're not going to. And it was as simple as that. There was a question about the choice of judges. The mechanism for the choice of judges is by something called the Judicial and Legal Services Commission. That commission comprises bar, presidents, senior counsel, all sorts of people. Notably, as far as I'm aware, no politicians. There is no perfect system that will get rid of all prejudice. Because we're human. <laughs> I think the question was asked, can politicians be appointed to the bench? Uh, Ex-politicians. I believe the convention is that a politician, an ex-politician, can not be appointed to the bench before the expiry of either five or ten years from the time he ceased to be a politician. But more importantly, if I was a politician, and I have the very greatest of respect to all the judges on the Caribbean Court of the Caribbean Court of Justice, if I was a judge from St. Lucia, and a case came from St. Lucia, 
involving a first name, mm -hmm. I would refuse myself. I mean, that is, that is so basic. Uh, having said it's basic, of course, I may consider I am not involved, and so I don't refuse myself. But you may think, but I am involved. So the human aspect comes into that. And finally, um, this person, this young lady from the, sorry. Ms. Henry. Ms. Henry. Uh, from the newly commissioned, not commissioned, uh, certified lab. We have a fundamental difference, you and I. You deal with science, with fact, with provable fact. I, as a lawyer, deal with persuasion. <laughs> <laughs> Where, and by itinerant, I mean 
The Eastern Caribbean Supreme Court, that's its decision, which sits in nine member states and territories. The first place I sat as a judge was in Nevis. The first time I had ever been to Nevis was when I went there to sit as a judge. Within a few months, the pandemic hit, and I sat in a house by myself with my family and children in St. Lucia and a computer on a daily basis dealing with cases in Nevis. And as I said, even in St. Lucia, as a magistrate, I hardly knew anybody who came before me. I, I understand that we, 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 we speak about the fear of people knowing people, but every independent study that has been done, he said, kids and Nevis where I sat. The international agency that came in to assess the judiciary found that the judiciary in the Eastern Caribbean is among the most independent judiciaries in the world. <laughs> I don't go to the rough shops with people who appear before me the next day. It is a distinction between our fears, and this is why I think that dialogues like this, because I do think, and I speak personally, not from, from the African court, that sometimes where the court can do better is in being able to have a continuous dialogue in the society so that we can allay the fears. I, I, I don't sit on cases. I'm sure Michael Gordon, when he was a judge, did not sit on cases. If I see what I can call that, I would say, I know her, send the kids to the next judge. And in a region with over five to six million people, and I gave the Caribbean Court of Justice nine judges will know. Six million people in the region so much that they cannot be independent judges in, in, in the issues. We also have an idea, and everybody went to school together. Well, at St. Mary's College, there were 600 boys. And I went to St. Mary's College probably about 100 years after Michael Gordon went right? <laughs> <laughs> Sir, I went to the University of Buckingham. I don't know everybody who went to Buckingham. And I don't know everybody who appears before me, and I don't sit on cases of people who are familiar to me. It's a fundamental principle that we hold close to our heart as judges, so much so that I find the job is frustratingly isolating. And it's what I was speaking about when I said earlier. That, that when you get educated to do this, because 12 years old, my teacher said, you're going to be a good lawyer. At 40 years old, people say, you're a good lawyer, but you know everybody, so you can't be a good judge. We are deliberating our people because we're saying that our people are incapable of integrity. And I hold this very close to my heart, it is not true. That's if a judge knows someone, the judge has an obligation to recuse himself from the case. And even the Lord of Hoffman that I referred to earlier, he lost his career because he did the same thing and he eventually had to leave the bench. And that is in England where they the 86 million. And we learn from this and we say closely, every Justice Saunders, who is the president of the Caribbean Court of Justice, the amount of times I've heard him say this thing to be independent. Something that we hold very, very, and extremely close to us. So I understand that we have these fears, but sometimes we need to think it through. The second thing that I think about a lot is this. Let's go back to the statistics that I was talking about in terms of the Great House. In 2005 or 6, I remember I was actually having a conversation with Sir John Compton. And he was, at the time, I was in his office on, um, on the boulevard. And he was trying to get a flight out to go to the inauguration of the Caribbean Congress. I remember that day. And he said to me, no, this isn't needed. And as I went through the statistics, so John Compton stood an aggregate of 30 years as Prime Minister of Sydney. So he never once went to the Privy Council for anything. He was not brought there. He didn't bring anybody there. Dr. Kenny Anthony stood an aggregate of 10 years. Not one single political case was ever taken to the Privy Council. 
You have Mr. Shasta. Then you have Stevenson King. In the 55 years of our existence, Privy Council has never been an institution that has ruled on anything of a political nature in Saint So when we make the argument, somebody said, you want to hear the other side? Well, yes. But sometimes I think we ask him to retain an institution for reasons that we may be using it for. We haven't had a judgment in five years. Then what difference does it make to the issues? But here's what happens. Within the context of our own thoughts, the average person who, who is coming to court is not suing a politician. And for the people of a country to have justice, we can't hold them back because we fear about cases that we're not even taking to the Privy Council. But what about the woman who's divorcing her husband and who is agreed by the judgments of the court? What about the neighbor disputes that you have? What about the road traffic cases where you don't think the judge gave you enough money for your, your damages? How does that matter less? to us than the hypothetical scenario of if we may take a case to the Privy Council about a politician that we are not taking the Privy So it, it, it's sometimes, I think, 10 years on the bench, so little of what I do has anything to do with politics. And so much more of what I do has to do with the poverty and the pain of the society. And sometimes you wish that people had an access to another court to get that further look at their cases. Sometimes I think, more than anything else, what troubles me is how much we spend in the hypothetical and the practical of what really goes on. 99.99% of the work is not about politics. In fact, I believe, that it's a personal belief in mine, politics and justice has to matter to a society is to allow us to carry on with our lives. And the justice system has to manage, it has to hold people accountable. But you go and look at the decisions and you realize that the justice system is doing that more than we think. Then the other question is whether past politicians should be judges. I think you're entitled to have a view on that. And you're entitled to express a view on that. But I will say two things about it. Number one, the work of the court is so extensive and so broad that in my opinion I will not limit the experiences of those who sit on the bench. So for example, a pastor, if a past politician has retired from politics, somebody goes into politics and they feel that politics is not good for them. In fact, William Taft, who was the president of the United States, left the bench and became chief justice in the United States because he didn't like politics. And if you take a politician and you put him in a different island because he likes family law, or commercial law, or, or areas of law that he has expertise in that has nothing to do with politics, then why should his expertise not be used? He has to adhere to the principle of recusing himself when in the eyes of the public, it may be wrong for him to sit on a case. But in a region of 5 million people and 15 or 20 different islands, where his expertise as a commercial lawyer could be used somewhere, his expertise. But that's an opinion that I have, and I see the views on the other side that people are entitled to have. Even as a judge, the rule is that if I retire from the bench now, I cannot appear before court for another 10 years, because I've just been a judge. So there are rules that are designed to shield the court from issues of bias. Someone asked about, so the court is in training and why in training and did. Every country has already signed on to the CCP in its original jurisdiction. Every country is already paying the loan for the funding of the CCP. But many of the countries that have not signed on, including Trinidad, that have not signed on because we are having the same discussion. 
When I was growing up at home, we had one bathroom. There, everybody looks at the other put. It's going to say, well, Why are you going to be here? And the other person says, Well, because you haven't gone to be here. So why have we not left the house because nobody wants to go and bathe first? This is a discussion. Every time it comes up, we ask the same question and we kick it kind of down the road and we kick it down the road. The Trinidad has probably not signed on for the same reasons that has not signed. For the same reasons other countries have not signed on. Sign on. And ask yourself whether they are worse off or better off of being a part of the court. When you are a country that didn't take a single case to the Privy Council in 10 years, that takes five or six or seven or eight cases to the Caribbean Court of Justice in two or three years, it tells you why you should sign up. Because now you have an option that you did not give yourself. Ask yourself, has Barbados or Guyana Belize or Dominica been that bad off that the judges are friends with the politicians over there and they're drinking and having together so all the politicians in this thing. My name is politician number one thing that they're just doing. So the point I'm trying to make is some of these questions, it's not that I don't think, I think they are legit, legitimate questions. But we have to take a step back and ask ourselves uh, certain things. When you say to me that a child in Kakubama can be a good lawyer, he can be a good magistrate, he can be a good judge, he's never sat on the case where any of his friends have been litigants. But you will tell him, I don't trust you, not because that has ever happened but because I think it will happen. I believe, folks, and I know there are persons who express their lives, and I would not be a part of a court if I thought it was corrupt, if I th thought it was not independent, if I thought these judges were drinking grub with their friends and hearing it in cases tomorrow. That is not what uh, is happening. And so, the appointments, I think, um, Mr. Gordon spoke about the appointments. As I indicated earlier, the process of appointing you know, judges to the Caribbean Court of Justice is actually the most independent process in the world. I ask us, look at what happens when the judge is being appointed to the Supreme Court of the United States. The Senate and the politicians decide. The President chooses the judge most times based on political issues. That is not what we do. And I feel that there needs to be this dialogue for us to understand that. I am committed and I believe that my colleagues are committed to an independent court. And I think that is precisely what we do. So that is my response uh, to those issues. I'm not sure if there's anything specific I left out because as I said, the volume was a little bit. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Just as Moise, would you like to make a comment? Would you like to comment on the, the call for a referendum on such a matter? Yes. Um, my, my personal view on it is business. I, I think the Constitution did not require one. I think this is the right time to their views on how best they think the process should take its course. I think my role is a little bit more along the lines of commending the CCG to you as opposed to getting involved in some of the more controversial aspects of it. But I will share my view on this. One of the uh, questions said, we heard the positives and we want to hear the negatives. And in light of that, I will tell you everything that has a positive and has a negative, including the process of a referendum. And sometimes we have to think about it. So here's what I, I, I want to leave with you as a thought. A 
At one point in time, the Privy Council was the final court of appeal of almost half the world. We are the only ones left. Not a single country had abolished the Privy Council by way of referendum. The United Kingdom has largely avoided referendum on issues related to its judiciary because most countries of that nature understand that there are sometimes political ramifications for the process and a lot of damage could actually be done to the justice system in that kind of process. Again, it is something that we need to think about. As I said in my presentation, the judges will sit on the Privy Council now. In 2009, the process for how that institution operated in England was changed with a simple majority in the British Parliament. And we didn't even know that took place. I think that there are dangers in certain aspects of the constitutional process being addressed, especially when what you're talking about is bringing an institution into the constitutional makeup from a foreign country in that nature. The second thing I will say about it is, let's just give an example of what happened in cases that we did. You have a general election and 90% of the population turn out. And the government wins an election in every single seat. Two years later, they have a referendum on the CCG and the turnout is less than 30%. So when you have 100,000 registered voters and 12,000 people vote, no, is that necessarily the voice of the people? Because Caribbean people will turn up for referendums. And the reason I think that is the case is we are asking the people in the referendum to answer a question that no modern post-colonial society has ever asked these people. If you're independent, your duty is to establish your courts. So the question is independence. And I think that there are disadvantages that as leaders and as people, as we think through how we develop our institutions, we must always think about the disadvantages as well. In the same way we think about the disadvantages of Caribbean court, we have to think about the disadvantages of certain processes because a lot of what is said about our courts, even some of the questions tonight tells me that there's a need for dialogue. The way on the streets, systems are being denigrated. Sometimes there's a lot of damage that's done to our systems in that process. Even in general elections, countries get very wounded. Some of us get tired. At the end of a general election, like everybody's accused in the other corruption and different types of things. Sometimes the processes, they're good, but they are negatives that we have to think about in terms of how we develop our systems. So that's my view, it's personal. So, you know, I'm not throwing that down anybody's throat, but think about the negatives, there are negatives. Thank you, sir. Thank you very, very much. Thank you. <laughs> Senator Dominic Pede, would you like to ask a question? Thank you very, very much, Dr. Rigobert. Thank Justice Moise for his uh, presentation and his time. I want to thank Michael. Can I call you Michael? Is that okay? Um, Michael Gordon Casey um, for uh, his uh, contribution here tonight as well. Um, I did say to him in private that I, do, I did disagree with him on the matter that this is not a political issue. Whenever we're going to a parliament, major constitutional reform issues, it is political. And so this is the quintessential political issue of our time, of changing our final And so um, what we both agree is that this is a time for the politics to rise above its parties and free. So we both agree that that's where we need to go. But gentlemen, um, as a young, black, proud Caribbean man. I am strongly in favor of the idea of the CCG. I am. I want to put that out there. 
But my problem with the proponents of the CCJ is the discussion and the justification seems to be more on colonialism rather than on dealing with the issues of trust that the people of the Caribbean have from time to time. And, you know, I listened to Justice Moise, who I think is a very nice man, I've never met him, but I love his spirit. And I can see his frustration because sometimes being a politician, I, I suffer the same fate as him in the distrust that people have just because you put on the political cloak. Um, and so I can see the struggle that you're having in trying to um, cause people to believe in the system because I could see that you believe in the CCJ. However, we have to be very frank with people as it relates to the issues, the personalities, the actors um, that are involved. And the more that we fail to give a frank and full disclosure about the various issues, I think the more distrust will grow on the various matters. So I have tremendous respect for the chairman of the accession committee, um, so that is Barry, who uh, I don't think I've met him, but I've admired his work over the years. But while I was Minister of Tourism, I went to St. Kitts. And um, so Dennis was on the bench at, the, at, at this time. And I sat next to a gentleman who introduced himself as the Attorney General for St. Kitts and Nevis in the cabinet of Tim Harris, who is a very close political associate. Um, I wonder then, Sir Dennis, um, that what, as I, as I sit here today, I wonder what would such a closeness, here we have a, uh, a very notable judge and his brother um, is in the cabinet of the Caribbean government. I, I wonder what situations like that can do to cause further distress and further questions raised about the, um, the, the separation, as we call it, or the reclusing of oneself from various issues. The president of the CCJ, Justice Saunders, it is reported that he is a candidate in, in past general elections, around an election with Ronald Gonzalez in um, St. Vincent and the Grenadines. Um, these issues need to be level with people. Because the more transparent you are about the actors, the personalities, when you're sharing your bio, it's important that you include that detail so the people will know who you are, your history, where you're coming from, um, and exactly what they have to deal with. We have Mario Michel, who was my MP, is now a judge on the OEC, OECS Court of Appeal. I was just looking at a news article he wrote in the landing Sanders matter. And there I am thinking this was a case, I mean it crossed my mind. Um, this was a case that involved a hotel that the UWP administration was trying to, to build. Uh, they didn't have any bearing. I'm not disrespecting the judge in any way. But it, it, these are the things that we deal with every day about our justice system. And so for us to ignore the fact that these intermarriages exist between our legal system and our political system, I think we're doing a disservice to the whole process of trying to get the CCG established. That's what I'm trying to say. And that's why I raise these issues to show that they are real matters. So here you have the Sandals landing space. UWP was trying to do the project. It was uh, adjudged by the lower courts that the DCA was right. It went to uh, several other justices. And here you have a former SLP minister, who now a judge, um, has, has dispensed 
justice on a particular matter. These matters exist and they are going to cause further distress among people in the Caribbean if we don't deal with them. And so, good justice, Moise. I am very happy for your frankness, your honesty. I love your spirit. I can see that you mean well, all of you mean well. But I think as well, you're also trying to say to all of us that as good as all of you are, and I admire Malcolm, uh, Michael and his work as well, I didn't think I could ever afford Michael. So I've never been to him for any work. And so when I hear this issue of cost, Justice Williams, I think that this is a fallacy. Because if I try to incorporate a company, what is that in legal fees? $3,500? Just in legal fees. No, not the government taxes. But the lawyer is going to charge you just to incorporate a company. Now, if that company has to go to court, you better have some serious money to deal with any matter of litigation. So the, the court here, I mean, when you mention how much it, it will cost to file a case to the CCJ, that's all about the court. But the biggest deterrent to the access to justice are legal fees. And so our people can't even afford to access justice at our lower courts. But yet you have gone and you've taken this discussion all the way to the apex court of the CCJ. We have a lot of issues in our lower court of a backlog of cases. A lot of the judges that have gone up to the CCJ have come from our lower courts. If they couldn't fix the judiciary system at the lower courts, why should we have confidence that they could do it at the CCJ level? If I take a fish out of an ocean and I place it in a different ocean, it doesn't change that fish. It is the same fish. So, I think that we have a lot, it's not that we don't want to support you, but we live this system every day. And I want you to, I mean, I'm sorry to be the one raising all of these issues because I'm a politician, right? And it, and it doesn't look good. But I couldn't sit here and allow all of this, all of these unanswered questions to go by uh, without us really addressing them. This is an important matter. It is going to have severe historic ramifications for our children and generations to come. And so I want that you and I to make sure that when we make a decision, we make the right one. I don't buy, I don't take the view of the fact that we're here tonight and we are going to our own parliament and we are laying our own constitution before our own MP. This has nothing to do with colonialism. That's out the window. Uh, I don't believe because the CCJ, uh, I mean the Privy Council, because it was uh, of colonial times, times have changed. We are now a sovereign, independent country, and a colon being colon colonialism has nothing to do with this. This is a matter of trust. We have some look at the Bar Association. The ex-president of the Bar Association is now the chairman of the Electoral Commission here in St. Lucia. This lady can go all the way up to the, I mean, based on what you've said, that she can go and be the president of the CCJ one day. There's nothing that disqualifies her. Why would we take someone playing such an active political role Right? And you want us to trust that system? So there are a lot of issues that we need to level with people in a real way. I mean, no disrespect. I just believe that these issues ought to be dealt with. Now, Justice for is one more thing. You mentioned a while ago that the UK has avoided going to referendums on its judicial system. That might be partly correct. But on the issues of constitutional reform, they have gone to um, a referendum, even when it does not require. So I'll give you examples. The UK did not need a referendum to go to the EU. To become a member of the EU, it, it does not require constitutionally for the UK to do it. 
But they felt that the decent thing to do was to put such an important decision to their people. And so they went, when they were going to the ECCU, the European uh, Community, they went through to the referendum. Now, to come out of the ref of Europe, the UK also went to its people. Hence, we have Brexit. And so, in important constitutional reforms, it is always good in public law, in constitutional law, to ensure that you have your population on side to, I mean, someone said it, um, I think it was my good friend Ozzy Boy, having two-thirds of the vote in parliament does not mean that you have two-thirds of the voters on side with you. There were three referendum, referendums in the Caribbean, Michael mentioned two of them, but Antigua also had a referendum. 33% of the voters turned out to vote in Antigua. And that referendum failed by 700 votes. There were 15,000 people who voted, right? So why is that? Trinidad refuses to be part of the sport. So th there is still a lot of anxiety. The fact that these referendums have failed tells you, good justices, that the people of the Caribbean, they have an issue of trust. Now I know in the court system, um, why her in court? I could never ever have a frank discussion with you like this. Okay? I would have to say, Your, Your Honor, blah, blah, blah. Now, <laughs> when the beauty about the town hall meeting forum is that we can level with each other. <laughs> right. And I hope you don't take this personal. I am basically just leveling with you that this is what politicians face on a daily basis. And this is what going to a wrong shop, sitting down, and buy some other drink, this is what, this is the opportunity you get. They tell you how they really feel on important matters like this. I thank you very much. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. Thank you for that. Um, if, if I can just proceed. Just, just to indicate a couple of things in terms of uh, some of what is raised. And the idea that, as I've said earlier, the cost of going to the Privy Council vis a vis the cost of the CCG and the cost of litigation in our courts. The, the first issue that I want to raise with that is when I look at the sheer volume of the work that we do in our courts, and I balance it with the people who are actually coming to court. I feel extremely confident that our courts are engaging in the process of litigation and the average person is getting access. There are challenges and I will explain what I think the challenges are. It's my personal view. Recently I attended a, a seminar. And there were judges from, I believe it's a court in New Jersey or some other place, other place. Where there are millions of people and 30 judges in the Court of Appeal. And the, the judges in the Court of Appeal in New Jersey, in that place, delivered about 100 judgments a day, the 30 judges. Court of Appeal of the Eastern Caribbean, there was about 90 to 100 judgments a year, six. It is actually the busiest and most active court per capita. And the average case that is before our courts are not the rich. People are, uh, I see, much more death, divorce, molestation, since I've been on the bench and I've seen it in the and people are coming to court and I'm telling you why. When we established our institutions, our universities, the people who are going to study law and who are becoming judges are no longer the elites of society. When I became a lawyer, my clients were not banks. They were not insurance companies. Not you from down on the road, 
the love we learn from Donna Rhodes said that I realized boys are loyal to him. And I was not the only one. There is a mammoth amount of pro bono work that is taking place in our courts. And it's a story that I think sometimes we need to begin to tell. There was a rule, I used to sit in my office and the judge used to say, listen, this person does not have a lawyer, they don't have money, but you have to represent them. And we go to court and we represent people that have no money. Because it is the right thing to do. And that is a part of the story that is not being told. When I remember a case came on my desk, maybe sometimes the personal stories would have clarified for us. When I looked at the case, I realized this person, it is an injustice for this person to have a defense, to have a judgment against them, because there is no case. My senior in office said to me, oh, then, you have to do justice even when people are poor. And we go to court and we fight cases many, many times that are not unique, which is why I spoke earlier about what I want to I'm not unique. If you go and sit in the courts on a daily basis, you will see that the average person is coming to try to resolve their problems. And then sometime ago we realized that because of the volume of book and because of the nature of the challenges that people were bringing to the courts, we decided that we need alternative forms of resolution, that mediation. And we set up a court connected mediation process so that people can get it to resolve their disputes without the full cost of litigation. There's still a lot of work to do. We need a lot. We need a lot. But the point that I'm making is that a lot of these values are coming down to us because of the CCP. Let's talk about the backlog. We have an itinerant court, I sat in Davis, there's no backlog in Davis. Justice Saunders, who got to the CCJ, we said, okay, there are backlogs, and these people get there. Justice Saunders sat in Anguilla, he sat in many places, and he did not preside over jurisdictions that had backlogs. Some of our jurisdictions have peculiar challenges. St. Lucia has a very high rate of crime, it's the largest volume of cases. We have had situations where our courts have been shut down for sometimes for months because they do building to see. So let me tell you what my experience is. When I was a practitioner, private practice. We were involved in another case that lasted three months. The cathedral another case, remember that, that it lasted five months. It was one judge. I have seen judges sit on the bench from 9 in the morning to 5 in the evening without a bathroom break, dealing with sufficiency here in case cases. Because there's nobody else to do it. <laughs> and then you have high rates of crime, high levels of litigation. It places a heavy burden on these judges to form. And when you look at the output of our court, it is the most significant output per capita anywhere else. So what I would commend to you is the ability to work together to solve these problems. But if you're not if you're not even taking any of these cases to be because of the first place, then that's not the issue. So I think that there is going to be done on the cost of litigation. And as I said earlier, again, I'll give you an example, there may be personal example, it's getting after nine o'clock, so I hope people are not getting tired, but I'll give you a personal example. I had to file an appeal once when I was a young attorney. And we were, we had a paper system. The client paid me $5,000. By the time we printed the paperwork and put the bundles together to file, the bundles literally cost us $4,500 to file it. 
and we went to the Court of Appeal for five hundred dollars. So you know what the court has said? We will establish an e-litigation portal where you don't even have to print the documents anymore. You file them on the internet. You file one copy without printing it. And so that has, if I were to be filing that today, the $4,500, the cost of it would probably be zero because of the reforms that the court is implementing. So the court is not blind to the challenges. It is where it can is implementing the processes to make it better. And where it cannot, it falls on the persons to provide it. So we are taking measures as a court to reduce the cost of litigation. But all we ask is for others to join us. When it comes to, I mean, for, for example, I, it's not my role really to be dependent upon it, so I can only refer to what I've said earlier in terms of um, people's past lives, but when you're talking about a, someone who's been a judge for 35 years and never been involved in politics for 35 years, and whose record is stellar, then I, I don't know what else to say. But the concerns are not concerns uh, that we are blind to. The last thing that I want to say is, when it comes to the rule of the CCJ in some of the issues that we raised yesterday, I think it is not accurate to say I think it's only about colonialism. It is not. The point that I make here, the Caribbean Court of Justice has actually had millions of dollars in for funding that it has used to go into the various territories where it is the final court to, to implement policies in relation to backlog reduction. I have personally done most of my training as a judge under the Caribbean Court of Justice in our local judicial education institute on things like judicial independence, court management, and backlog reductions. And I can tell you the statistics are telling us that in our civil courts across the Eastern Caribbean and most of our criminal courts across our in-itinerary report, we have no backlogs. So in Lucia, we have a peculiar problem because of the volume of crime and part of the challenges that we have in relation to infrastructure. And we have to find ways internally to solve these problems. And it is precisely the experience of some of our judges having gone through those challenges and understanding what it entails that they can then sit on the Caribbean Court of Justice and assist in resolving these problems because independent donor agencies have faith in the court to provide the kind of resources so that the court can now come down as a final court of appeal and address the problems because the judges have experienced it. So I feel very confident. I understand that there are challenges. I think that there are there's room for dialogue, room because I think part of the problem as well, is that in, in, in the court's quest to be independent sometimes, we've gone in a bit of a, a you know, people who need to know a little bit more about the work that But it isn't fair sometimes when I see the amount of the work that some of our judges are The loneliness of the job. You see, in order for people to not accuse us of being biased, we stay at our homes and we, we you know. I isolate our support. We need some problems. I believe the Caribbean Court of Justice is a conduit through which that can happen. And I commend the institution to you. Second, lastly, um, historically you're wrong to say that there was a referendum for the entry of the Euro into the European Union. There was not. And a lot of people in Britain, a lot of people in Britain may disagree with you as to whether Brexit was a good idea. We had one of the strongest currencies in the world, tumbling, on a tree, tumbling, so we will decide later on. That is my, my contribution, and I hope that it has been valuable. Thank you very much. At this point, I will invite my colleague,
Minister, Welcome. Senator Fahey. But before I do that, in response to the commentary that it appears as if many of our panelists were pro-CCJ, you are advised that at 6 p.m. on Monday next week, at the Anglican Annex, which is near the Anglican Church in the city of Castries, at 6 p.m., another such event will be hosted, and we are likely to have panelists who afford you a wider range of perspectives as per your observation and wanting to expose you to the various schools of thought on this. So Monday, 6 p.m. at the Anglican Annex in Castries. As a Southerner, I'm also duty bound to say to you that eventually, too, we will be hosting one such event in the South. Right, Mrs. Melrose? Yes. Absolutely. And so that those in the South can be exposed to this and participate meaningfully. I will afford Senator Fede the opportunity to do the vote of thanks. You shall pass. <laughs> Allow Senator Fede to deliver the vote of thanks and to forewarn him that he is not to abuse the privilege of the microphone. <laughs> <laughs> to Justice Moise, that I'd invite him to visit Justice Moise on the beaches in Anguilla, the sandy beaches, if Justice Moise is allowed to go to the beach, Justice. I don't, I don't have time to go to the beach. Mr. Fede, over to you for the vote of thanks. Thank you very much um, for doing Let's hear it for our moderator who has done such a fantastic job. instructed to be kind to our guests this evening. I would really especially like to thank um, Justice Dennis Barron um, and Justice Mohis and his team for coming out tonight and putting on such a great presentation and giving us the clarity that is needed um, to, uh, to, to make a better informed decision about the CCJ. However, Justice, this is not the court. This is a, a, a town hall meeting. You're absolutely wrong about the UK. Please give me your facts, and then you can give me your call. I, I would also like to thank the audience. You've been a terrific audience. You've had a magnificent job that you have done. Your questions, your comments have just been most insightful. I thank you all very much. Put your hands together for yourself. I want to thank Michael Boria, who uh, the Justice said is a hundred years older than he is, um, for bravery. it. Um, this might be past your bedtime. Well, not past his bedtime. And um, he's just braved it tonight, and I want to thank you for participating in such uh, a very important um, juncture of our history. I want to make a very important decision um, to move from the uh, CC, the uh, Privy Council to the CCJ. Um, tonight, I want to especially salute, I mean, the biggest problem with us tonight goes to a lady who has led the charge on this matter. Um, and I want to thank no other than Miss Fortuna Bell Rose and the Education Committee for the great job of them and the Thank you very, very much. Madam Bellows, where are you? Stand up, take a bow, please. please. And, and, and the rest of the education committee. Yes, yeah, Dr. Ray. Yeah. Um, yeah. Ricky. Ricky, yes. Alexander. Oh, yes. Who else? That's all of it. And all of you, you, we love you all for putting on such a fantastic uh, presentation uh, here this evening. I want to thank the chairman. Andy Daniel for the great work that he has done in um, helping to conceptualize this 
please give it up for our children of the United Nations Party. And I want to commend similar initiatives to be done by the leading administration to go across the country to uh, really go and explain to people what we're about to do so that they can ask the questions as well. So thank you to the United Workers Party. Thank you all very, very much. Thank you, Justices. Thanks to everyone. Oh, I forget. Uh, Mr. Carol Williams from the A Mr. Ray Williams from the AG's office for a most exceptional job. Thank you very, very much. We know this is a very, very, very challenging time for your department, but we want to especially thank you. Thank you. Please, please hold on one moment. You have with your evaluation form. One more minute. Can you please complete it before you rise? If you have completed it, we have some fantastic ladies who will just walk the ad and collect them from you. Thank you for. And just this voice, I do apologize. But thank you very kindly. Thank you for that. Thank you, Mr. Byron. Sorry to get to hear your voice, but thank you. Thank you very kindly. Thank you. We do need the pencils for Monday's exercise. So if you can see some kind of